Lord Dr. Chuck Missler is in Nelson this week, and he's taken time out today to have a chat with us. Welcome to Nelson. Gary, it's nice to be here. Nelson's one of my wife's favorite visits. We have been on the uh, South Island, and, and she fell in love with Nelson, so we, we enjoy New Zealand a great deal in general. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, so welcome to Nelson. And uh, seeing you've arrived here today, then it sounds like you're going to try and get a bit more good at it by uh, coming again. Well, absolutely. Right. And, uh, we, we've come every year so far for okay. a while. Mm -hmm. Now, you're <laughs> a honor graduate from the US Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. You have a master's in engineering, a mm -hmm. PhD. Now, you're also the, a former CEO of Western Digital. And yes. that's a pretty big company. It is now. I took it out of bankruptcy. Okay. Uh, I actually have um, served on 12 public boards. I was chairman and chief executive officer of six different public companies. Western mm -hmm. Digital is perhaps the best known one, mm -hmm. but uh, four of those six were uh, publicly traded defense contractors. So I've spent most of my executive life, some 30 years, in the high tech arena mm -hmm. and specifically focused on what one would call the strategic community, the intelligence okay. community or the defense industry. Some folks say you were one of the leading pioneers in packet switching and network was. technologies. Yes, actually I was. Did the first worldwide uh, network while I was part of the Ford Motor Company. Um, we also uh, were the first to render the packet switching protocols into a chip at Western Digital. Uh, Western Digital's long suit back in those days when I first took it over was in the communications area. And so we right. pioneered a number of innovations that the packet switching, of course, is the technology that undergirds the whole internet Fine. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one thing we do have in common here is I got my amateur radio license when I was at high school. Okay. Just well, like you. So, you betcha. Yeah. So yeah. you're called W6OHD. Yes, and indeed. Are you active on that? Uh, only recently. I actually, uh, when I got uh, went in the Air Force and so forth, I became inactive. Uh, and I really laid off for a long, long time. When I moved to Idaho, I reactivated as KD7ELR, but it wasn't on very much. Just recently, uh, I, like in the last few months, I sort of had the yen to get active again, and I also got my old call back, because they no okay. longer limit that to the zones like they used to. Yeah, but same w, here. Yeah, W6 call, that was a California call back in the 40s, so that you know, pins me down to the late 40s, early 50s as a call. So, right. so that's why I thought it'd be worth hanging on to that old call. So, you know, Willie Six, old hound dog. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we might have a chat with you on uh, one of the channels Look forward channels to that. We'll look okay. Probably on 17 meters. Yeah. yeah. Now, tell us how you got involved with preaching. You know, we look at here as a man who's been very successful in business, in high technology, <coughs> And how did you get involved in preaching? Well, you should understand that I was a techie from the beginning. Even as a child, I had a technology aptitude. And I was really heading for, you know, I was in a math science major in high school, and I was, I, would have, on a, I was on a path to get a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford. That was the, along the way. Uh, and I'll, I got derailed from that another way. But the point is, also though, uh, even as a young kid and as a teenager, I developed a very early passion, interest, what have you, of, in the Bible. And so uh, I studied it fairly intensively just as a kid. Uh, n never felt called or dr you know, drawn into a ministry per se. I just loved the Bible, learned as much as I could about it. I happened to have the benefit of being well tutored by some very uh, well-known scholars in that day. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, uh, and even when I went off to the Naval Academy, um, I uh, participated in pre reveille Bible studies and such. Uh, throughout my executive career, some 30 years, um, my primary hobby was Bible study. And uh, I taught the Monday night Bible studies at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, which is a very prominent church in Southern California, for 25 years. But I did it as a layman, I did, and I did that Monday nights because I realized that with my intense executive schedule, I was traveling and building companies and what have you, I needed the pressure of a, an audience Monday night to keep me in the Word. So I used to travel with a commentary and I'd mm. bone up a chapter ahead of my class. But that was my, I did it, it as, as just a labor of love. I didn't mm -hmm. take myself seriously as a Bible teacher until uh, I also had developed for many years a close friendship with a very prominent author by the name of Hal Lindsey. Mm -hmm. And Hal and I were very w w great friends from way back. And uh, uh, during one of my, when you're in the executive world, you're up and down and I was in one of my valleys for a while. Hal came over, he and his wife came over, and uh, really uh, 
ch challenged me. He says, Chuck, what do you like doing best of all? He knew what the answer was. I just like Bible studies. He says, has it ever occurred to you <clears throat> to make your hobby your profession? And I told him I didn't feel called as a pastor. I didn't have that gifting. So he says, you don't, he says you wouldn't have to. He says, Chuck, with your following, he realized, and we both, I guess, did, mm -hmm. that at that time <clears throat> there was something like uh, five or six million tapes of mine scattered throughout the community through the Firefighters for Christ and giveaway ministries. So I had a following of sorts, even though my profession was as, a, as an executive, a turnaround executive, a high technology executive. So, uh, but with his encouragement, I gave it a try and the Lord blessed it. So I have to say that it was really Hal Lindsey's energy, commitment, and patronage, if you will, that got me started uh, in the path that I'm on. That was about 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we have uh, not only a, a ministry of, of uh, study and preaching, we've also formed this uh, think tank on the internet. Mm -hmm. And we now have members of that uh, in, in 40 different countries. Mm -hmm. And we have thousands of people taking our, we have, developed expositional verse by verse studies on the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. But we are also converting that to courses so they can get university credit for doing that now, all on the internet. So that's really our primary passion these days. So I really, about 20 years ago, shifted around that I made the, my Bible studies my primary commitment. I still serve on a couple of boards that are rather classified, but uh, uh, that's really very incidental to my, my, uh, my priorities. Okay. Some say the United States was founded on strong Christian principles. Absolutely. The pioneers and so on. That's well documented right. and very, very, and it is okay. the reality. Yeah. Uh, God but are we getting away from that today and are we the seeing the results of that? Uh, we have been drifting away from that for some time. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one of the most difficult things in my life in the, in the recent years is to come to the realization that the America that I grew up in the America of the 50s and 60s and say 70s um, is a thing of the past. Uh, what I used to regard as patriotism, and bear in mind I was in the strategic community for 30 years, and as I say I was a chairman and CEO of four different publicly traded defense companies. You know, it's in my blood, and yet it's it's with great grief that I acknowledge that the uh, what I used to consider as patriotism I now regard as an obsolete form of idol worship. Uh, the country that uh, was founded and prospered uh, is one that has abandoned God. We've, in, in the, if you study it carefully, there are literally over 80 indicators, uh, social indicators, uh, that you can map, and they're all, they were all improving up until about 1961, 62, 63, and they suddenly start going the other way. So from Nixon, it all went downhill. No, not Nixon. Well, he may have. That, that's not the point. No, with that the main things that happened in the when you start trying to analyze what happened in the early 60s. That's when Supreme Court decisions were made that took God out of the schools, made it, it took Bible reading out of the schools. You couldn't pray in school. We, we, we legislated God out of our public schools. That was a major thing. And, uh, and then, of course, we're also murdering something. We've murdered something like 50 million babies. And uh, the country's financially in trouble with Social Security because um, if, if you would have let those babies live, go to school, raise families, and be in the workforce, you wouldn't have the disruption of the, uh, the, the welfare system that was in installed. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's, it's collapsing. And of course, there are other mistakes being made now, too. But the net of it is, mm -hmm. is that America has abandoned God. And uh, I hold the view, tentative view, that uh, we are under what's called the abandonment wrath of God. There are about five different wraths of God in the Bible. But one of them, you could call the abandonment wrath. Samson experienced that when, you know, he woke up once and realized he didn't have strength anymore. God had abandoned him. That must have mm. been a shock to him. Are we repeating like the Roman times when they got into promiscuity and that was the demise of the Roman Empire? Absolutely. I think the uh, the uh, 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 Hosea uh, was assigned by God to go to the Northern Kingdom, mm. and he told them they had joined themselves to idols, leave them alone. God's wrath on them was to abandon them to their enemies, and that's mm -hmm. what he did. And I think that's the, exactly what's happening to America. I think America is uh, is uh, reaping the whirlwind, and uh, mm -hmm. the America has, has uh, is no longer uh, adhering to the rule of law that it was built upon. Even mm -hmm. the laws are being disregarded by the courts and by, by mm -hmm. the administration. So we have, it's literally, the, the, the technical term is lawlessness. Mm. 
uh, the laws are not being honored. When a, when a secured creditor before a bankruptcy court discovers he doesn't have first standing, that pulls the rug out of all credit. The whole credit structure is collapsing. And, uh, and so uh, we could go on and on about that one. Yes, but I think the America uh, that we knew is over. And uh, I think that's going to impact not just America, it's going to impact the world at large. Mm. There's been a little bit of debate over a comment you made about peanut butter in a jar. Oh, Can okay. you tell us what that's all about? <clears throat> well, I don't know what the, it's really quite simple. Uh, we use that as an example that um, we take a, a jar of peanut butter, which is uh, an open thermodynamic system. Mm -hmm. I mean, heat can go in and get out. Uh, in this case, we have materials that are even are, are organic, organic in the first place. And moisture in there. And, and so uh, I always, you know, if the, if the hypothesis of the evolutionists, the microevolutionists are right, the biogenesis types are, then if you take matter and, and uh, energy, you can have occasionally life. Mm -hmm. And so what I usually do, build that up and I unscrew a brand, I go to, the, I bring to the occasion a brand new bo jar of peanut butter, or it could be baby food, whatever, mm -hmm. from the market. And I cautiously open up to see if there's any new life inside. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's not, and you're relieved that there isn't. Mm -hmm. The point being that um, you have matter and energy, but that in itself doesn't produce new life unless so what's missing. See, the, the, the equation that the uh, uh, biogenesis people uh, postulate is incorrect. It's matter plus energy plus information mm -hmm. that creates life. And so unless there's a spore or some kind of contaminant in the jar, you obviously don't have... It has to life. already be there, though, doesn't it? But, but the point is, you know, we actually conduct over a, we, uh, over a billion experiments every year and have done so for virtually 100 years, and we never produce new life with matter plus energy. In other words, and, and so uh, uh, unless you introduce somehow some mm -hmm. information. So, uh, so my, my background is the information science. So the, what, that re, that what it's intended to reveal is that there's an error in their equation because they have a missing link called information. Mm -hmm. And the, the, uh, the Darwinists cannot explain the origin of life because they cannot explain the origin of information. Mm -hmm. That information came from someplace. I'll give you a better example, by the way. Uh, at the Rand Corporation, 1955, uh, we published a book called A Million Random Digits. Now, if I laid it here and showed you, you'd laugh at it because it's a book of just random numbers. No, no. <clears throat> it was a milestone back in 1955 because the Rand Corporation examined those numbers, the computers, to make sure there was no symmetry, no repeatability that there was no ability to predict the next number. In other words, it had to be truly random. The point being, and, and, and to the average person it looks like a joke, but to someone who's a scientist who has occasionally in a laboratory a need for a random number, where do you get a random number? Whatever procedure you use makes it non-random. And so it, it, it turns out to be a, a mathematical uh, paradox. The point is, we, they used computers to wash those numbers to make sure that there was no design. Mm -hmm. Design and randomness are opposites. Mm -hmm. Now once you really understand that mathematically and in terms of the information sciences, you now find yourself in a culture in which the culture clings to this idea that we've been designed by randomness. That's a contradiction of terms, that's absurdity. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but it's disturbing to realize that we have legislated in our culture, in our schools, and even in our laboratories. Now, if you're a scientist, you better not let them know you're a creationist or even hold mm -hmm. that view. If you, if you aren't clinging to uh, what I'll call the god of randomness, uh, you have career problems. So mm -hmm. the point is, we live in a culture where truth has been legislated outside of our culture. But this whole, I this whole idea of intelligent design is an exciting breath of fresh air because here's a number of brilliant guys who are not necessarily Christian believers, but they recognize that the elegance of design is everywhere in our universe, whether it's a leaf or a bird or whatever. Now, as we study it, the designs we encounter are so elegant, we're just beginning to understand them. And so, uh, the, to attribute the elegance of that design to random functions is a demonstration of ignorance, mm -hmm. that they have no idea what the word randomness really means. And so uh, I use the little peanut butter thing as a colorful okay. demonstration, but uh, 
uh, the main point is is that the f entire food industry mm -hmm. depends on the fact that matter plus energy does not produce new life, thank goodness. I spoke to a guy a while back about evolution mm -hmm. and he was talking it right back through to the Big Bang and when I said to him, so who caused the Big Bang, his comment was, God only knows. <laughs> yeah, that's a good line. Yeah. Because, yeah, the, the, the whole Big Bang, the, first there was absolutely nothing and then it exploded. Yep. That explains everything. Okay. That, anyway, go ahead. One of, one of the things that has been raised is Notre Dame has made a whole bundle of predictions, and, which is well, widely documented. Some they're very documented, except they're very ambiguous. Yes. And they're so misrepresented. And could be interpreted many ways. Yeah, and okay. when you get into that, it's all, it's, it's, really, okay. it's really nonsense, but right. go ahead. The Mayan calendar also predicts a lot of astronomical events and scientists have raised the issue is how did they calculate without computers things so accurate and, and their predictions to date have been superbly accurate. I can't comment because I haven't studied those. Okay, so all right. Pass they on. are making some predictions about a major event uh, December 2012. Oh yes, it's an election year. Yes. <laughs> There'll be some. But it is also a period where there are other significant focal points coming to a head. May very well be. And, okay, uh, not something you've looked at. I haven't, okay. uh, I, I, my staff is looking at some of that, but I haven't kept up on it yet. And uh, I think that uh, um, we, should, we need to be very careful there, even as biblical believers, because divination is prohibited in the Torah. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the scripture and the purpose of Bible prophecy isn't to predict events. No, but it's, it's to glorify God yeah, when they happen. Sure. There's a big difference to that. Okay. And uh, people, I happen to be an expert on cryptography and the so-called Bible codes, and I don't mean just the equidistant letter sequences. The point is, there are some things there that are too, prof too profound to ignore on the one hand, mm -hmm. but there's so much nonsense being promoted by people who have no background in cryptography in the first place, and secondly, are using it for divination. Mm -hmm. And that's against God's law. So mm -hmm. we need to be cautious. The divination is a is not a spiritually healthy uh, mm -hmm. enterprise. But but aren't we told that a wise man will know the season, uh, but not sure. the hour or time of day? Sure, sure. Okay. I think so. Are we in the, the season? The, absolutely. I think the true believers will not be caught by surprise. Okay. They'll be in an atmosphere of expectation. That's okay. not the same thing as setting dates. Okay. What do you think is going to happen over the next few years? Looking, we are looking heading ahead. right now. I can tell you, and I, I, I we may, we are active, uh, involved uh, uh, participants in a global uh, intelligence network, and uh, we spend a lot of energy monitoring the basic. That's what we're here to speak on uh, here in Nils, on our, on our lecture tours. <coughs> so we have uh, what we think are well-informed perceptions of what the horizon in general looks like. And I can tell you that the horizon worldwide, in the US in particular, but worldwide, is more turbulent than most of the professionals have any idea. And uh, I think the, uh, the uh, collapse of the global credit system is on everybody's mind. It's far more serious than most people have any idea. I think the, uh, the dysfunction, dysfunctional political system, the dysfunctional legal system in the United States, all these things are, are going to be imploding and creating a crisis the likes of which we've never had in, 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 in uh, our several centuries of history in the U.S. So I think that and when you add to that the nuclear tensions between Iran and the rest of the Muslim, understand the Muslim world is divided into two houses, the Shiites, which is Iran and Yemen, and the Sunnis, which are all the, the other 80 uh, percent, they, they hate each other as much, almost as much as they hate Israel. So. There are tensions in that world, and when you start giving those kinds of people, be it Pakistan or be it Iran, nuclear weapons, that's a, a recipe for major ter turmoil before we even get to North Korea and some of that madness. So clearly the planet Earth is facing some disruptions that are um, unprecedented. And, uh, but what's interesting, that's exactly what the Bible an anticipates. But there is a biblical scenario that one can study and try to understand and it would seem that we are not only heading in that direction, but the rate at which we're heading in that is accelerating. Mm -hmm. One of the things, even as a, as a uh, somewhat uh, informed observer uh, of, of these things, I think most of our staff is stunned as we begin to realize the pace at which these things are happening. So 
clearly ask, what, what am I expecting in the next uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 months? Is huge global disruptions of all kinds. And I'm not about to predict what will happen. That would be not foolhardy. But at the same time, it's clear that the disruption is coming. And the key to anybody that's a steward, whether it's for himself or for a business, is to have a, a, a valid perspective. And it's clear that the kind of turbulence that's coming, the, the rule books that we have studied over the last many decades are out the window. Mm. The world is changing. So a spiritual relationship advice is maybe better than any advice you could give folks oh, in terms of business. Not only that, it really accelerates that to our number one priority. What, the only way a person is going to be able to survive the coming turmoil is to have deep spiritual roots. Mm -hmm. And it's time, uh, I think, even many Christians who have become complacent or, or uh, apathetic need to wake up and realize it's time to get serious about the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It's time, incidentally, I think, as we study these passages, to try to put on the shelf some of our presuppositions and look at the text afresh. Mm -hmm. One of the exciting things that's going on in the field of biblical scholarship, we're beginning to discover aspects of the ancient texts mm -hmm. that we hadn't even perceived before. I'm on the review committee for the International Standard Version Bible. And uh, 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 there are textual discoveries. Uh, I don't mean that the manuscripts are better. No, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. We're beginning to realize what it really says mm -hmm. and its relevance to today. Mm -hmm. uh, there are technological statements all through here in anticipation of the very technologies that you know, we're dealing with every day. So it's a, mm -hmm. time, it's a time of focus. Mm -hmm. It's a time when we need, uh, uh, if, 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 if a person's not a Christian, they better investigate who this person called Jesus Christ really is and the claims he made and realize how they've been substantiated mm -hmm. and how that's the first step of course. But even those of us that have been Christian in some sense, it's time for us to get serious mm -hmm. and, and uh, what we like to say, we call it raise the bar on our spiritual walk. Do you think that some of the churches need to embrace new technology? Because quite often we see them on street corners on a Friday night talking to invisible people. Mm -hmm. And we've got all these, this modern technology, television, and I understand you're on Calvary mm -hmm. uh, Chapel Radio, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. that's broadcast here in Nelson on 88.7 and uh, also on 106.7 across Golden Bay. So mm -hmm. we get to hear a lot of these uh, things mm -hmm. on there. But do you think that some of the churches could embrace some of this oh, new absolutely. technology better? Oh, absolutely. And I, and I think that not only the technology in, in a broadcast sense, but it's astonishing to realize the value we have today in the information appliances. Uh, p uh, uh, I carry six Bibles in my PDA in my phone. phone. Uh, it's interesting that the Christ the, the, the today a Christian can explore the biblical text without knowing Hebrew or Greek because he can put his little arrow on a word and immediately the computer will pop up what lies behind that, if it's Greek, what the Greek meant. Mm -hmm. It'll even diagram the sentence if you like. And that software that does that is free. Mm -hmm. In other words, today a student of the Bible in say a half an hour can accomplish more than a pastor, say, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. could accomplish in six weeks. So you can click on Jesus and up come Yeshua or, and, or and, the lights. And you can find it, or you can take a word like millstone, and it'll immediately tell you every place in the Bible it occurs. Okay. And that's the cute clue as to what it really means. Yep. Uh, and so the, uh, having an electronic concordance is part of it. Uh, having a, an electronically supported lexicon is another. So it means that without spending four years in seminary learning Hebrew and Greek, mm -hmm. you can use the Hebrew and Greek without knowing Hebrew or Greek, with the appliances that we have today. So you can begin to get into what it really says and what it really means with more clarity, more precision than uh, uh, was available. Chuck, what do you say to the viewers that are watching this program at the moment that are not Christian, that maybe think that churches are for marrying you and burying you? Well, it's what a, do you say tragically, to a lot of those churches are just for that. I think the whole issue is the person of Jesus Christ to find out who he is. And uh, uh, our whole ministry was based on two discoveries. And it sound, uh, uh, the first is we have these 66 books that we call the Bible. They were penned by over 40 guys over a period of almost 2,000 years. 
we now discover that every detail, every number, every place name is there by deliberate design. There are elements in the early books that take meaning only later. In other words, so we discover two things. It's an integrated package. That's the first mm -hmm. discovery. And I'm a, that's, that's my business, information science. Mm -hmm. But then out of that comes a second discovery that's staggering. The origin of that message system, it's an integrated system, had to come from outside the dimensionality of time. Why? Because it anticipates history with great precision long before it happens. And that's an attribute that only God has, not even the angels. God alone knows the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And he uses that attribute to authenticate his word. And mm -hmm. so once you realize that, you suddenly realize this book is supernatural in its origin, and it has a complete guide um, for the individual. And it tells you exactly what's coming. We know, it, take the nation Israel. It, it's distinctive in that it, its whole history is here. Not only how it started, its ups and its downs, and its ultimate destiny is all laid out in advance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, it, once you begin to discover those things, then you begin to realize that, that uh, we're not here by accident, uh, that we, ha we are the beneficiaries of a creator mm -hmm. who cares, who's involved, uh, and, and is anxious to reveal himself to us. And uh, so it's a, it, it opens up a whole new world. And many mm -hmm. churches, um, you know, we use that term churches so loosely, the great tragedy is most churches don't believe it. Hmm. They'll, they, they'll use it uh, as sort of a social instrument or something, and that's fine, I'm not here to knock that, mm -hmm. but it's refreshing to find church leadership mm -hmm. that really takes the Bible seriously and puts the Bible as the number one priority in what they're doing. Is it true that Psalm 118, I think is the central verse and that the smallest verse is 117 mm -hmm. and the largest verse is 119, but the center is 118. Is that, mm -hmm. is that, that true? That, that may, in, a, in, a, in a linguistic sense, that may be true. Mm -hmm. Certainly 117 is short little. But little it's thing. just one of the many fascinations that people are finding, isn't it? Oh yes. Well, and you talk about the Bible codes. Well, not only that, but we also discover in Psalm 69, there's a glimpse into chi in Christ's childhood. Most people, many pastors have no grasp that that uh, uh, the, those years in Nazareth mm. were very unhappy years. Why do we and celebrate his birthday when it doesn't, where I'm not aware it says we that's, should? That's because that's a church tradition. That's a, just a church tradition. We know that he wasn't born in December. Oh. Had to be September, October, because the, the sheep were in, uh, in, in yeah. the field. There, that's a whole area that is, nowhere does it uh, instruct us to celebrate his birth. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not the emphasis. What is important is to understand that uh, the, the gospel, in fact, most churches don't preach the gospel. We use that term gospel so loosely. What is it specifically? Paul tells us in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15, it defines how Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures. He didn't just disappear. He didn't just die. He died fulfilling over a hundred specific specifications. And, and uh, that in itself is astonishing that he was buried, even only Paul emphasized that because he builds an analogy with baptism on it, and that he rose again the third day according to mm -hmm. scriptures. Ask the average pastor, where in the Old Testament mm -hmm. does it predict he's going to raise on the third day? And there's actually mm -hmm. th at least three places. So the point is, uh, many pastors don't realize that mm -hmm. Matthew took shorthand. And was he crucified on a cross or a tree with a stake on it? A cross, a cross. And uh, trying to build a tree argument is pretty silly, except uh, you have to tie it to Numbers 21 and it, there's more to it. But the other thing, another just a subtle little example, uh, Matthew was a tax collector. It was a job requirement to take shorthand. That's why Matthew's gospel is longer than the others because he actually takes the major discourses down verbatim. And those are things that g gives you a respect for what it's saying that's often lacking in the average, uh, uh, you know, Sunday school kind of uh, Bible study. Uh, no, uh, the, more you, the more seriously you take it, mm -hmm. the more you discover and then the more you discover, the more seriously you take it. That turns out to be a very constructive, regenerative okay. cycle. Well, Chuck, thank you very much for taking the time and coming and seeing us here today. Very interesting, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again in Nelson. It mm -hmm. doesn't sound like we have to persuade you too much to come Oh, back. no, I love, we love New Zealand. We'll t t come here at any, with any excuse we can find. Great, right. thank you very much. That is Dr. Chuck Missler, and he is in Nelson today.
program was made with funding from New Zealand on air.